Hi, Grade 12. We're finally on to um, sketching graphs, which is pretty much what we've been trying to lead up towards. Um, and I love drawing these graphs. They're just fun and different, and you never know what they're going to look like until you've tried it. Okay, so there's a couple of examples, and then we'll practice a bit, and then a couple more examples. And so I'm probably going to make um, several different videos because it does take quite a long time to just consider one graph. So let's look at our first example. I've written, written a little description on the side here because there's loads of different types of graphs. So this first example is an example of a polynomial. So it's not a rational function in that it's not a fraction, where you basically have one, one function over another. This is just looks pretty much like a normal quadratic would look, except this is to the power of 4. So this is draw the graph showing all intercepts and stationary points. And I should probably have written in um, points of inflection as well, because we should label those in if we have them. So what would my first step be? I always like to go and find x-intercepts and y-intercepts. So very easy, x-intercepts is where uh, y equals 0. Of course, this cannot be done in a calculator because it's to the power of 4. But not to fear, because there is a common factor of x cubed. So now I get 3x plus 4. So clearly, x is equal to 0 or x is equal to minus 4 over 3. Now, really importantly, um, x is equal to 0 appeared not once, not twice, but three times. So there's definitely going to be something interesting going on there. In fact, I'm pretty sure that that means that it's a stationary point, because remember when an x-intercept appeared twice, it happened to also be a stationary point. And in fact, it now appears three times, which means I'm pretty sure that not only is it a stationary point, but it's probably also a point of inflection. We'll figure that out as we go. But that would be my prediction. OK, y-intercept, um, very easy, 0, 0, because when x is 0, y is 0. So done. So immediately I know and possibly like to keep a little kind of like summary on the side so long. So it's definitely going through there. And then minus 4 over 3. So that'll be somewhere around about there. So it definitely needs to come down somehow, and then it'll have to turn here and go back up. And notice it doesn't come down again. So there's no ways that it turns again or turns again, something like that, simply because there's only two intercepts. So this point of zero has to be, I have to be going through it and keeping on going up. I don't know how the pattern's going to work, so I don't want to commit to anything. But I definitely have to go through that origin and then keep going up. Okay, what I would do next is um, look at my stationary points. Notice I never mentioned a single thing about asymptotes here because asymptotes only exist in rational functions. So there can't be any asymptotes here. So first derivative would be 12x to the power of 3 plus 12x squared. So make it equal to 0. And what do you know? x squared is common. 12 is also common, actually. So this is x plus 1. So I know that x is equal to 0 is a stationary point, and x is equal to negative 1 is a stationary point. Now that makes sense, because negative 1 will be about there. So it makes sense that the graph will come down, turn, and then this is also going to be a stationary point. Now I'm pretty sure that the graph doesn't turn like that, simply because that would me make it cubic. And it can't possibly be going up again because there is no other intercept. Now, this is going to be really weird for us, but half the time you have no idea what this graph is going to look like, and you kind of just have to look at all the evidence and then figure it out. Now, stationary points are coordinates, so I should give them as coordinates. So, 0, 0. Negative 1, don't forget that you need to put negative 1 in there. So, negative 1 in there, and then negative 1 in there. We generally don't show working in AP Maths. You can just do that in your head pretty much. And I think I get negative 1, negative 1. Right, so that's the stationary points done. Now, the only thing really to consider here is, is there a point of inflection? Now, why I would look for a point of inflection is if this is going to be a stationary point, but it's not going to turn, I'm pretty sure it has to do something like that. And so let's look at our point of inflections. Now, don't forget that just because the second derivative is 0, does not mean there's a point of inflection. So I'm going to find my second derivative, and my second derivative, if I start from this point, is 36x squared plus 24x. And so what do you know? x is common. That's why I knew that it was going to be um, a point of inflection, because x was going to be common in the second derivative. Um, 
I don't know, I think I missed out an X there. That would make more sense. Now notice I didn't take out 12X, I could have, but I was being a bit lazy. So I get X is equal to 0, or I get X is minus 24 over 36, which is minus 2 over 3. Now, there is no guarantee that these are points of inflection. If these are points of inflection, they could occur. They could occur here. But there's no guarantee that these are points of inflections. So how do I check if they're points of inflections? What I need to now do is I need to check my second derivative before zero. So let's pick like now negative one, for example. Then I need to pick, I need to do my second derivative at one. And negative two over three, maybe I must do my second derivative at negative one third as well. So negative one third and then my second derivative at 1. Now why am I doing that? Because negative 1, if I just draw myself a, a little number line here, negative 1 I know is a stationary point, and I know it's negative 1, negative 1, so I know it's there. I know that, and I know the graph has come down like this. At 0, there could be a point of inflection, and at negative 2 thirds, now negative 2 thirds is about there. So I want to check my second derivative there, there, and there. So that's why I've chosen 1 for there. I've chosen negative 1 third for there. And negative 1 I've chosen there. I could also pick something, you know, negative 4 fifths or something. It doesn't really matter. But I want to check in each of these intervals what is the concavity. So what I've done is I've gone and put negative 1 into my second derivative. And at negative 1, I got positive 12, which means my graph is concave up there. Now I'm going to go put in negative 1 third. And at negative 1 third, I get my second derivative. So I should probably write it there. I get a negative. So here I got positive 12, so the graph is concave up. Then the graph is concave down. And finally, when you go and put in 1, you get 12, so you get a positive again. So therefore, my graph clearly goes from concave up. So this part here, from my point of inflection down, will be concave up. Then this part is concave down to our next point of inflection. And then it's concave up. So these actually are both points of inflection. They don't necessarily have to be. Now what you could do, which is pretty nifty, is you could use the table function. If you didn't want to do all these substitutions, you could use the table function. Now don't forget the table function is when you go shift, um, or maybe you go just to mode. Yeah, you go to just to mode, and then you go to the table function, which on the AP Maths calculator is number 7. Then you can put in the second derivative, so you can do 36x squared plus 24x, and then you can say, I want to start looking at the values from negative 1, through to 1 and you want to go up in 1 thirds and then you can track the sign of the second derivative like that. Personally I just prefer to substitute some values in. But basically it means that I know I have two points of inflection. So let's try and draw what we know so far. Without actually working out those points of inflection and checking that they are indeed points of inflection, it is very hard to get the shape of this graph correct. Now remember, we don't exactly draw to scale, so you don't have to stress too much. But basically what we know so far is that we had an intercept. We have a stationary point. This is an intercept. So let me just scroll up to check what my intercepts were. Minus 4 over 3. So let's maybe go up in thirds, if I'm going to make this look vaguely plausible. So this is minus 1 third, minus 2 thirds, minus 1, minus 4 over 3. So this was my intercept. My um, turning point was at negative 1, negative 1. It doesn't really matter where I put it. So negative 1, negative 1. At negative 2 thirds, I have a point of inflection. I would need to substitute that in to my original function to find out the y value. So I substituted that into my original function. And so if this is at negative 1, that would be about negative 1 half. So I got a point of inflection at um, negative two thirds and then to two decimal places negative zero comma five nine so somewhere around there then I know that I go straight through there and I know that that's a point of inflection 
and then I know I go up again. So we're never judging you too much on finesse of these um, functions. So we don't have to worry too much. But basically, my graph's going to come down. It's going to be stationary. That's a local minimum. It's going to go. It's going to be concave up. Then it changes to concave down, stationary point, and then it changes to concave up. So as long as you can pretty much see that it looks like the concavity changes at each of these points of inflection, that is a pretty cool graph. I mean, I never would have known that that's what it looked like. And what's even better is that not all um, functions to the power of 4 look like this. Some functions to the power of 4 turn three times. Some turn only once. It's, I just love it. It's so much fun. Right, so now that we've done an example of a polynomial, Let's look at our next example. Now, our next example is an example of a linear function over a linear function. Now, a linear function divided by a li linear function is actually a different way to write a hyperbola. So there's two ways to do this type of question. You could just treat this like a normal function and find its intercepts and stationary points and asymptotes which without even realizing it is a hyperbola. So let's try that method first. So if we didn't realize this is a hyperbola and we thought to ourselves, right, Let's go find our x-intercept, so y is equal to 0. And immediately I notice, well, the only way for this to be 0 is if the numerator is 0, because if you multiply the, the denominator on both sides, you, it disappears. It Basically, I know that x is equal to 4, because my only option is that your top could equal 0. So immediately I know my x-intercept is 4, 0. Okay, let's look at our y-intercept. Y-intercept's even easier. You don't even have to show substitution at AP Maths level. You just sub in 0, and if that was 0 and that was 0, I get 4 divided by negative 2. It's negative 2. Remember that I'm only marking the graph unless I've asked you a question about the intercepts, and so as quick as possible is always better. Stationary points. Now, the only problem is if I'm going to go and find stationary points, I'm going to be now finding the derivative of a quotient, then trying to solve that, and we all know that a hyperbola does not have stationary points. And so I am going to show you that, but I, I do think that this is an example of where realizing that a linear function of a linear function is actually a hyperbola makes your life a lot easier. So I should just check my asymptotes. Um, I can't factorize, and so this is definitely no removable discontinuity. I have x is equal to 2 as um, my vertical asymptote. I should probably write that, vertical asymptote. And because the degree on the top and the degree on the bottom are the same thing, this is going to have a horizontal asymptote. And if I find the limit as x tends to infinity of negative x plus 4 over x minus 1, we all know that um, the shortcut is basically it simplifies down to the ratio of the coefficients of x if they're the same degree and they are. So I know the answer is going to be negative 1, but if I want to do it the long way, I divide the top and the bottom by the highest power of x. So this is just the limit as x tends to infinity. This will be negative 1 and 4 over x, which will tend to 0. This will be 1 and 2 over x will tend to 0. So this equals negative 1. So my horizontal asymptote is y is equal to negative 1. Okay, which is another confirming feature that this is a hyperbola because I found a horizontal and a vertical asymptote, which means I could pretty much draw this now because I know it's a hyperbola. If I didn't, if I didn't realize that every single um, linear function of a linear function is a hyperbola, you would now go and find stationary points. And unfortunately, this would be quite a waste of time. So don't forget that the derivative is differentiate the top function, so the derivative of minus x plus 4, which is negative 1, multiply, leave the bottom, subtract, dif leave the first function, so minus x plus 4, times differentiate the bottom, which is 1, all over the bottom squared. Now, when you make this equal to 0, remember the bottom is going to have absolutely no role in this. So actually, this is going to come down to the top. So I get minus x plus 2 plus x minus 4 all over x minus 2 squared. Now, x can't equal 2, so the bottom can't equal 2. And look what happens. The top becomes negative 2. 
over x minus 2 squared. And so you'll notice there is no solution, because basically you would need negative 2 to equal 0, which it can't. Now, just out of interest, have you noticed that this means this gradient is always negative? Because the denominator in this gradient equation is squared, which means it's positive, and the top is negative. So that means this is a monotonically decreasing function, because this gradient is always negative. So, this is definitely a hyperbola. We've been drawing these for years. We're pretty good at them. Our hyperbola says that um, x is equal to negative, so x equals positive 2 is our vertical asymptote. y equals negative 1 is our horizontal, I hope I said vertical there. Um, horizontal asymptote is y is equal to negative 1. Our intercepts, if I scroll up, our intercepts were at 4 and negative 2, so 4, 0 and um, negative 2, which will be about there, and the graph is going down the whole time, which I could see from the equation. I should label that, and I should label that, and there we go. My graph is decreasing this entire time with no stationary points. How lovely. Now, how could I get around this? If I knew it was a hyperbola and I didn't want to do all that effort, or I didn't do too much effort, how could I get around this? Well, basically, I could do a little bit of a case of partial fractions. So can I write negative x plus 4 over x minus 2 as a normal hyperbola, which we are used to? Now, I know the denominator must be x minus 2, so it's not exactly like a partial fraction, I suppose. Um, but it almost is, because I know that that must be the equation. Well, how would you combine this? You would have said a and b would have had to have been given the denominator of x minus 2 to make it an LCD. That's how you would have made an LCD on that side. So I now know that negative x plus 4 must be equal to that numerator. So negative x plus 4 must be equal to a plus bx minus 2b. So it's exactly like a partial fraction, really. Now, this is the only function, I mean, the only term with a b, and that's the only term, sorry, that's the only term with an x, and that's I know that these two have to equal each other, which means I know the coefficient of x has to be negative 1. So that means I know that 4 must be equal to a minus 2 times negative 1. So that's plus 2, and so a is equal to 2. So basically, I can work out the fact that this version of writing the hyperbola can be written as 2 over x minus 2 minus 1. Now, does this help me? Well, it helped me because I know that I mustn't look for stationary points, but I could know that by just knowing that linear divided by linear is a hyperbola. It does help me to see the horizontal asymptote. I could have seen this vertical asymptote regardless of doing this, and your x and y intercepts you still have to go and find. So actually doing this conversion wasn't particularly helpful for me. So what actually I would encourage you to look out for in the future is not to necessarily morph this to looking like a hyperbola, but rather to just realize that as a hyperbola so you don't go looking for stationary points and points of inflection. Okay, that was quite fun. Okay, last one for this video. We're going to look at several examples of a quadratic function divided by a linear function because they can look all weird and wonderful. There's various different ways that a graph can look. So the next couple of examples... This is the last one for this video, but even in the next video, we're going to be doing quadratic divided by linear. So this says, draw a graph of, and I can see I'm missing an f of x, which equals x squared minus 4x plus 3 over x minus 1. And I probably should say, including intercepts, stationary points, asymptotes, um, discontinuities, points of inflection, I probably should say them all. So let's have a look. Well, first of all, um, can I simplify this just out of interest? I just, I'm irking to factorize that top because I'm pretty sure that it factorizes to x minus 1 and x minus 3 over x minus 1. I'm pretty sure. Which means that this x minus 1 can actually cancel. So actually, f of x is equal to x minus 3. Now that's a straight line, but x cannot equal 1. So basically, I'm going to have a removable discontinuity at x is equal to 1. We've discussed that in our asymptote section. But f is a straight line. So I always prefer to look at can you simplify the graph first. So first step 
always so I'm just going to write here always check if you can factorize and simplify because you might be trying to find stationary points and intercepts whereas actually this is a very simple straight line so always check if you can factorize and simplify so this is our first example of a quadratic divided by linear sometimes that quadratic is factorizable and can cancel which basically makes a straight line with a removable discontinuity so that's one of the options this is very easy to draw then because y is equal to x minus 3 I don't even have to really bother about it's fairly easy for me I know this goes through minus 3 I know it goes through 3 and I know it's a straight line the only thing I have to go and do is I have to put a hole in it because when x is 1 which is somewhere around there there's a hole in the graph which means I'm going to have to erase my graph because I don't have a small eraser how do I know what the y value is well I find the limit if I go and put in 1 obviously I can't put in 1 to the original but if I simplify can I put in 1 and 1 take away 3 is minus 2 so at 1 negative 2 I'm going to have a removable discontinuity so if I actually just draw that again in a different color I go straight oh it would help if I picked a picture there we go straight through there and it's a straight line so as long as I've labeled my intercepts which I have minus 3 and 3 and my removal discontinuity I'm done this actually wasn't too bad at all so I'm going to stop this because otherwise I think these videos can get very long but in our very next video we're going to be looking at three other examples of quadratics divided by linears before we go do some practicing cool hope that was the start of some fun